Hello and welcome to E-Commerce Matters brought to you by Black Curve. We help e-commerce businesses make pricing decisions. Today's title is Competitor Pricing on Shopify. I'm Philip Huthway, founder and CEO of Black Curve, and I'm joined by Dr. Rob Horton, product director at Black Curve. He was on holiday for our last recording, so we had the excellent Alan Timothy on in his stead. So hopefully Rob is well rested and firing on all cylinders for today's particular podcast. You can judge for yourself. And his tan is certainly looking better. Well, it's gone down a bit more recently, and he'll tell you why in a moment or two. So without further ado, here we go. (laughs) I don't have a tan. <laughs> so, Phil, the wonderful listeners as to where you actually went on holiday. I went to Cash in Turkey. Um, Ooh, very and jealous. I, and, then, and I flew home a day after the uh, new lockdown <laughs> restrictions came in on the travel corridor. So I got a two-week quarantine. But it was completely worth it. Um, I don't know. I think most people, most people who know me know I love food and I love cooking. And it's... The produce over there that you can get is just so good. We're just on a in a villa by the sea, by the Aegean Sea, and it's cooking and swimming and reading. It's really nice. Would recommend. Worth worth the quarantine. <laughs> and you're now you're not you didn't have get coronavirus, and you are now allowed to socialise. Well, within within the the new news <laughs> restrictions that have come yeah, in place yeah, yeah, yeah. since since then. Uh, <laughs> I don't I don't have more than six friends anyway, so. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's probably not too far from the truth of myself as well but before this is not meant to be a mental health situation so let's talk about uh competitor pricing on shopify um before we dive straight in i think uh it's prop time what have you brought to symbolize today's podcast rob right so i have we we, i I don't know who's gonna out nerd each other but mine's quite nerdy so i have a t-shirt um and so this T-shirt says, I heart goose porridge and bread. Now, I don't expect anyone to understand that. But what it is, is that I, since lockdown, I've been playing Dungeons and Dragons every week. And at the end of each season, a friend of ours, actually, you know him, John. Yeah, yeah. He, he designs a T-shirt. And the reason I've got it is that because he's now starting to do that through Shopify. So he's expanding that out as kind of a little side hustle. So this is my... Shopify t-shirt as it were I was thinking where you were going to go with that that is that is <laughs> is that meta it's sort of it's it's kind of you know a few levels few degrees separated from Shopify but is he use is he going to use Shopify to yeah, sell them he does so this this is the, this is the point like and I think this is the real power of Shopify not to jump ahead too much but someone like John it's so easy for him to spin up a store and get going he did a Udemy or a Coursera course um, which I'm sure lots of people I've been doing them over lockdown and I, he said reckons it took him 10 hours to go from zero to fully functioning a store and he's not um, he's a he's an ops guy by trade so he's he's technical when he can code a bit but he's not a developer by any means he's just like a normal normal person and is that 10 hours including training time as well or is that uh... yeah 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 he did the course was how to get a dropshipping business up and going on Shopify so you just follow the course through and at the end you're you're good to go. Nice, nice. Well, we'll have to interrogate him further, won't we? Uh, <laughs> in, in future future cases. Maybe we'll get him in on the next podcast. Yeah, we should get him in on the podcast. <laughs> to be fair. Shall I show you my prop? Yes. I'm feeling a bit embarrassed now because you've gone you've gone rather quite clever with yours and I have <laughs> I've probably taken it far too literally and also committed theft from my two year old boy, if I'm honest. Oh, so I have a shop. I have a little shop. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> um, I will admit, I was telling you, you earlier, PMS, though, it yeah. doesn't work anymore because um, he did drop it the other day. So it was actually functioning when I picked it for the for the prop. Um, so is it actually Rupert or is that what you do Black Curves accounts on? Well, there's there's a lot of money in there. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a, 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 in a there. fake paper <laughs> credit card. Uh, but I thought, you know, hey, Shopify, Shopify. Do you want to hold yours up as well at the same time? Mm. Yeah. Look at that. There we go. Loving it. (laughs) (laughs) 
So for those of you listening and not actually watching audio, you're probably like, what the hell is this? So shall we actually <laughs> deliver some value? Um, so for those of you not familiar with Shopify, I thought it would be good to just give a brief explanation. And, and those of you who are, maybe um, a bit of an insight to the background in terms of their origin. So it is a Canadian multinational e-commerce company, and they are headquartered in Ottawa, Ontario, for geographers out there. Um, the, the name Shopify is also the name of their product. Okay, so it's Shopify by name and Shopify by nature. They offer online retailers a suite of services, uh, including payments, marketing, shipping, customer engagement tools, to simplify the process of running an online store for merchants is, uh, is the tagline that, uh, that they adopt. They've got reported to have a million businesses uh, using their platform. So uh, depending on which uh, financial uh, broadcast you read uh, some of them say it's over reported and others say it's under reported but what we can say it's a shit ton of people <laughs> using Shopify <laughs> and it's a it's used in approximately 175 countries and that was as of 2019 so maybe they've snuck in some some new new countries in there in terms of size of the amount of money that's going through um, in terms of um, revenue generated by the sales of products going through their through their business. So um, not not the revenue going to Shopify. That would be pretty nice. Uh, it's sixty one billion pounds worth of goods sold through Shopify platform. So massive, massive, massive company and massive supporting in terms of the eco ecosystem of e commerce. It's, it's supporting a, a large chunk of it. So in layman terms. Okay, which is what I quite like sometimes, is it allows you to very quickly spin up an online shop. Okay, and, <laughs> and really quickly. I think I think is the uh, is is the key from from my perspective. It, it's a really. But I'm a product guy, obviously. It's in, it's in my title, but like, I think it's one of the coolest product first kind of companies out there in terms of how easy it is to get up and going and the things they do. I don't know if people follow their product roadmap, probably not, but uh, um, it's all focused around making it easier and easier for people to get their shops online, whether to spin them up in as a new business or move into it. So it's things like they even provide credit for merchants. So um, they'll lend you money to get your stock that then you can sell back and that kind of stuff. Um, so it's, it's a cool business. And, um, I'm going to get his no name wrong. Tobias, it's the founder, Tobias Lucker, Tobias. We'll go with You're, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but he's a good one. I'll find it on Twitter, but he's a good one to follow on. Shop. Their, their marketing is on point as well. Um, and they're a really good one to follow on Twitter because what they've done, I think, fantastically well is um, build a build a community. Yeah, Toby Lucker is build a is build a community and make people want to be part of it and do the digital marketing thing just exceptionally, basically. Uh, how to get online. These are the things you need to do. Focus on your brand. Let us automate everything else. It's really, really powerful messaging, I think. Yeah, and I suppose today, without getting into the pros and cons of different um, different technologies, it's certainly, I think there's a misconception that Shopify is for you know, early stage businesses or, or, or businesses on a lower lower revenue um, revenue trajectory. But I mean, just to, I suppose just to quickly summarise, you know, my view and my research of, of it, you generally go for Shopify if you want a, you want your, your e-commerce store to be a bit more on rails. So as in, mm -hmm. you've got much more of a safety net. It's very much plug and play. You can, you can, drag and remove additional modules and it can kind of grow with you um, on on kind of rails you do have customization in terms of you know ch changing the the format and the lookout and the feel but generally that customization is done um within within sort of certain certain kind of so confines I, so i agree and disagree with that assessment a bit um so, uh, i think of it this is going to be a bit nerdy I, but it's i think of shopify like a framework so for anyone who does front end um, back in the day, you used to write your own HTML and your own CSS, and now you use Vue, Angular, React, and it's it's much more on Rails. And there's real benefits to that. So the choice of that is just ease, but also it's ease in terms of getting people to run your store, getting talent in to, to help you because they've used, they've used the product elsewhere, like integration with other, which we'll go into, but integration with other platforms because 
it's got a consistent data structure that everyone knows and is there. So if you want to put, if you want to use some new tooling or, or do some reporting or whatever, you, you know how it is. So I think the, um, I think it's just a bit more modern in, in its approach to development than maybe some of the, the more configurable and custom, customizable ones in terms of, it's the configurable versus customizable thing, I guess, in that it's it's that SaaS thing of realizing that actually most people have exactly the same problem, solving that problem, and then making the bits that you do need to change changeable. But most people don't need to alter their underlying data structures realistically. They've just chosen them because whatever agency set them up sets them up that way. Um, yeah, so uh, absolutely. So you, you you can do you can do a ton of ton of stuff, but it's within kind of certain framework confines of um and then if you go outside of those it's sort of at your own risk whereas something like magento it's how yeah. how big is your imagination and you can you can you can completely go against the mold and you can have a completely unique shop that that mm. nobody else has has access to or, or or can or has 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 in their their environment okay so yeah there's there's pros and cons of doing both of both well, approaches yeah, and yeah, yeah, um sure. uh, we're not we going to get too much anyway. <laughs> we're not going to get too too much into into that that for today so um in terms of today's podcast title we're looking at um competitor pricing on shopify and and really about how um businesses on the, on the Shopify platform um, can, should be looking to go about their pricing, make pricing decisions, um, and we'll kind of take you through that journey uh, to, to, I'm going to, I've brought, I'm bringing back the term pricing maturity to take you back to, to being a mature, mature business from a, from a Hang pricing. On, I've, got a, I've got a swear jar for you here. So. <laughs> <laughs> Hang on, it's already full. Is that from last time? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, now it's important to stress that um, we probably we've probably already lost all listeners that aren't are on other on other platforms already by this point because we've spent the first ten minutes talking about Shopify. But it is relevant if you are not on not on Shopify as well. Some of the principles are are exactly the same. Okay, so uh, yeah, so for, so for any es- established um, e-com platform, whether you're on Big Commerce, Magento, WooCommerce, all, all of this, all of these, the principles are basically exactly the same. Um, and and so in order to prepare for this podcast i searched into google i <laughs> said uh, uh competitor pricing on shopify which is which is exactly the title and the first hit that came up was from the shopify community and i thought this is great and uh and and the question that was posed was do you track competitor prices how do you manage that process manually or by using a service and there was uh, this 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 comment by um, by by an individual called Maurice underscore Hunter, or that was that was their tag, and uh, and it said this is a bit controversial, uh, you know, the, um, the swear jars coming out, <laughs> but I don't give a crap about my competitors. <laughs> I focus on delivering a great product, a great service, and being top of mind. If you battle on pricing, you're entering a rat race. When, s- when initially setting my price, I do look at competitors to understand the market and then usually price a bit above. Then I establish what my cost per acquisition will be and adjust accordingly. This helps me, one, control my profits and two, quickly identify which products are most worth my time, money and energy. Okay. Now, I'd quite like to, to meet or talk to this, uh, yeah, he's talk, to this talk to this hunter. <laughs> uh, I don't agree. Don't agree quite with um, with all, all the bits and all the bits and pieces. And we'll, we'll, we'll go on to that in a minute. But it certainly hits the money where where we're talking about competitors aren't the be all and end all. Like they shouldn't be the only thing we worry about, um, but they do have relevance to a degree and that and it's un, you need to work you need to sort of and we'll, we'll work through this of how do you get to get to understand that relevance so you know from 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 your your perspective rob what do you think of this this comment on the shopify community um well i don't believe he's just completely disregarding his competitors because he says he isn't later on but i think his strategy is completely correct for building a sustainable brand i don't disagree with that at all it's um he's working out where he can compete and then focusing on the products that kind of will do better for him and the race to the bottom thing is is real we've talked about that before certain products you have to do it you want to spend as little time on them as possible because the margin is controlled pr- just by the price and so what it sounds like maurice is doing is building a brand driving people through 
I mean, I imagine for a lot of the community stuff, it's drop shipping. Um, so it's more into the kind of targeted adverts and sourcing the right products. Uh, so product mix, which we've we've talked about before. Um, because if you're, I think if you're drop shipping, it's especially relevant the product selection piece because really what you're when, when you if you I don't know go go on these drop shipping courses that we were talking about earlier, they, you've got to identify kind of your key a product a niche find that yourself source that yourself build a nice brand and website around that and that's kind of like drop shipping 101 and really if it's an easy accessible one that's just price driven it's not going to be very successful from a drop shipping perspective because everyone's going to be doing it so the margin is going to be tiny uh, and i quite liked the comment here that uh that said i like to look at my competitors and price a bit above and I have to yeah. say that is very refreshing <laughs> reading that <laughs> that 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 comment because especially when new businesses are are setting up and and going into an established category and are, are actually also selling kind of branded goods that are available elsewhere, there's a common assumption that I'm going to compete on price and I'm going to be the cheapest. And I think that's and that that's really the underlying message here that um, that Maurice is 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 conveying is that. The price lever is an essential one. It's one that you've got to get right. And again, we'll take 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 uh, users through that. But also, price enables you to work out how much power you have in other areas. Mm -hmm. Okay, you know, like the power of your brand, the, you know, all the way through to you know the power of your warranty or your return schedule. Right? These all have powerful indicators and can support you achieving a higher price. And it's worth saying as well that like. Uh, who is a true competitor? That that's really important, um, especially if you're drop shipping, because lots of people don't know how to run businesses. Who who drop ship probably don't understand, as Marie's mentioned, cost per acquisition. So tank markets. So actually, if you're matching the lowest price, that may be completely unsustainable because they're either selling below quote unquote true cost because they haven't. People forget things like shipping and all that kind of stuff or much lower. So I think you're much better getting that brand power and then working out kind of what your product mix is. Um, the interesting thing, that price is always, a, is always a factor, right? Because he's not saying, um, well, I just charge 10x on what I buy it for or, or, or whatever, right? He's still got to stay within that competitive region, so... Uh, no matter what he says, it's still pretty core cool to his pricing strategy. <laughs> so shall we go, uh, the quest first, well, question around how retailers themselves should look to tackle competitor data. From mm -hmm. from your perspective, where do you, where do you think businesses should start? What, you know, let's, let's assume that they've gone away and collected competitor data. Where are the, where are the various, where are the various avenues that they can collect it from? Yeah, so with Shopify in particular, it's pretty easy um, because you can either go through the App Store uh, or you can work with people like us. And we have a private app, not a public app. It's basically the same. It handles the authentication. If you have the the right data, basically if you have the right data in your Shopify store, we can get you going right away. For us, that is kind of barcodes, GTINs, product identifiers, Um and then we go off automatically, scrape the internet for you, collect that data from, in our case, Google Shopping, but other people will do more bespoke stuff if you have, say, five or six key competitors. And then you can, that gets fed automatically back into your store. Um, and if either through kind of a, a portal, so you can view it in a dashboard, or if you want to action it, you can hook up to some tooling like Black Curve, and we will automatically adjust your prices in your Shopify store for you. Um, and I'd like to say it's a click of the button, but obviously it's there's always some fiddling around with data and getting the mappings correct and the rest of it. But it's pretty easy. We like to think we can get people going in a, um, up and running and getting the data and like, really a few hours but the technical stuff and making sure it's the correct data and obviously prices are very important to the business and so the the due diligence and stuff takes a bit longer but so i think it's fair to say that 
within the first 24 hours, you can get a pretty good snapshot it's gone away and collected all of the data to give you a feel for what the market price is like. Um, and then, so within tw in 24 hours, you've got that feel. And then the longer that you leave it to run, so into a few days in a week, it starts to give you that first feel, proper feel of how the market's moving in terms of the frequency with which they're, with which prices yeah, are changing. Yeah. Or Equivalent. I think that's really that's completely fair. And if you look at us or our competitors, that that is the kind of cycle that people work to. And there's there's good reason for that because it's really down to the, the natural frequency of the market. I mean, if you're in certain industries, off the top of my head, I think of say tyres or travel and tourism, actually, where uh, pricing intraday pricing is much more important because of the the response to either demand or putting forward in supplier costs a lot of the time. Um, but for most people, selling FMCGs daily is all right because it's got to fit into your natural business processes and people's buying behavior, right? Like I, if I'm buying looks around the room for product that I bought GoPro recently, I talked about it before, but if that, it took that buying decision because it's an expensive purchase, uh, took me a month, I think around about a month. It was like, it's a, it's a vanity thing. I like it. I like playing around with it. It was really nice in Turkey to take photos underwater. It's cool, but like, I don't need it. And for, for whatever reason, I should be spending that money. But it was on sale for that whole month. It was on discount. And so when I came back, I still got it at that discounted price. I'd have, I definitely wouldn't have bought it if it had gone back up, how, however much it was at the end of it. Because I'd be like, actually, that's, that's too much. So, um, that kind of buying pattern really constrains the frequency at which you should be changing prices and therefore at which you need to harvest prices as well. So as a starting point, if you just have access to competitor data, okay, and and that's what you're looking at, before we've even made any decision, mm -hmm. so let's park the decision making, what what power can you take? What 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 can it what can it tell you? I mean, should you well, bother? Yeah, yeah, we're going back to Maurice here, aren't we? Um, we're going back to your product selection because it tells you if you know your product set and you have what your competitors are doing, you can work out your CPA, the uses term, you work out your costs, work out how much margin you need to make to make everything else sustainable. Um, and then you can look at the competitive market and just basically carve out a load of products that you can't sell. I mean, is, is this is the simplest thing to do. Um, there's more sophisticated thing within that is that you can look at kind of the frequency, like that, the how how rapidly the market is changing. And actually, if you if you spot products that um, if you spot products that you think you can come in under at and people aren't going to, that you think you can identify as kind of, that you think might be price driven, right? And that you can come under at, you can steal a market. Um, and so really that it's just down to product selection. It's not, um, it's not necessarily automatic repricing. It's just, can I sell this product or not? And it's a key component. And it's like anything, right? I mean, it's starting a business. When, when you founded, Black curve when you're raising money, what do people ask you? What's the total accessible value of the marketplace? Who are your competitors? How much do they charge? Like what are your margins? Oh, it's exactly the same when you're selling a product or, or, or whatever you're doing, right? Uh, yeah, and I think this product overlap piece is actually critical. Like re I think people underplay and undervalue that. Um, certainly the big boys in the big girls as well in the respective marketplaces. You know, they focus heavily a lot of time on product selection and making sure that they have exclusivity in this area or or that 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 their particular widget that they sell has has an extra feature that 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 other people don't don't have access to and that in itself is powerful i mean you know i i, I don't know the gopro market um, particularly well but I know when I was looking for looking for for cameras you know a, a year or so ago one of the things I found a retailer that was selling them in different colors to, mm. to, to others and and there's some people out there that that would would absolutely value a different color 
oh, and pay more for that product than than say getting it in a you know a standard. Well, I, don't, I don't know what standard color is these days, but let's just say silver or black or something. You know, something something mm-hmm. you know run run of the mill from a camera point of view, right? Mm-hmm. Whereas if you could say I've got the, I've got a red camera, I've got an orange camera, I've got you know you can stand out for the crowd, and that that's got a premium in itself. So so just as, as itself using competitor data to work out. What is my overlap with my competitors or what products are particular competitors selling? Where's their focus? And you might actually learn that, hang on a minute, I thought that, I don't know, uh, I'm going to pick what, what I normally search search in i don't know chain reaction cycles i thought that they were i thought that they were really big in mountain bikes but actually you do the analysis and you find out that well hang on a minute their product selection actually focuses heavily on road cycling so therefore uh, you know i'm looking to expand my cycling company therefore i'm i i perhaps have got a got a niche that i can build within within mountain biking or a sub niche within that so there's various so so just before we've looked at price i think that's worth drilling into um because i don't think we've explained what what we mean by overlap there in that you can see from the when you when you scrape you will not find that your competitors sell the same products as you right um and you can look basically the coverage and say okay who's selling what what categories do we have overlap in what categories don't we over have overlap in when do i treat them as a competitor when don't i treat them as a competitor right and it's um like you say it's super valuable because you may own one category and they might own a different category and especially if you're a newer business you may want to learn as well and what right how have they dominated this category like what's their product mix in this category Oh, that's interesting. They're selling, I don't really know bikes, but there's only they, they only they only seem to be selling a couple of chains. Well, I've got 10 of my books. Why have I got all these products when if I'm looking at these, like you say, big boys and girls, and they're only selling a couple of each? There must not be that much um, demand. Well, there might be, and, and they've missed a the trick, but like you can actually, if you're smaller, often leverage. They understand their data by looking at the market or understand their internal analytics by looking at the market if you're canny enough like how much they're spending on ad spend it will tell you based on position you come back like what products are they spending ads on based on the categories and where their positions are so the competitive data scraping if done correctly gives you a whole host of information beyond just what that price is it tells you about the internal business processes of the um of your competitors and also, when you get to a stage where you've you've got kind of a whole year of competitor data or, or beyond, you can start to use it to work out at what periods in the, the, the year are, is this competitor adding certain products. And mm-hmm. you might find that actually, you know, they're stealing a march on you because they have certain products available a month before you because they've identified that, that I don't know, one of the ones that I came across recently <laughs> was, uh, was paddle boards were being sold in in january i mean in the uk you've got to be pretty brave to get on your paddle board in january but you know so so it's kind of like you you'd sort of think historically that that's a seasonal product right but this particular company was actually decided to try and push it um and this was even before lockdown right this was this was last last paddle, january. paddle boards are an interesting one because they are sold all year round but there was some analysis recently i think maybe by amazon or someone working with amazon that showed that the price change in a paddle board they basically halve in the winter so really, just for consumers, um, it, it really is worth buying off season. I don't you ski, I ski, right? There's always the but you buy your ski kit at the end of season um, because they're trying to dump it before the new lines in the rest. Of it. It's exactly the same thing. Um, just as a little little anecdote, because I, I don't. What's what things do still in the winter? They are still heavily seasonal in my view, and you, you may not see it in the stock levels, but you do see it in the price. If, if that makes sense yeah but I, I think i'm looking at it absolutely that's correct i think i'm i'm looking at it sort of slightly more subtle than that in terms of are they are these products being made available you know a few weeks beforehand or you know a, a month before you and mm-hmm. and then and that that sort of supports the decision well hang on a minute you know i've I, i've i'm a buyer i've got to try and build a better relationship with the supplier to get access yes. to these yeah, products yeah, yeah, earlier exactly. um or or are they actually stopping selling them sooner so you know th- these sorts of things which can really really help you, I you think as the, business. i think the supplier thing is key actually there's a number of reasons why actually monitoring competitive data is important um one of them is if do you have minimized minimum prices 
like or map prices in the US, but a lot of um, a lot of suppliers have minimum prices in order to protect their brand value. And it's not uncommon for people to try and be a bit cheeky and dip below them. Um, and you can spot that, right? And then get on the phone to the supplier, get your get your competition in trouble. Why are you doing this, that, and the other? Um, the uh, and the other one again is that like, well, if someone can sell lower than you, do they have a or are getting products earlier? Do they have a better better relationship? Is their cost base lower? If they're a similar business, why is their cost base lower? Um, because you can basically tell what someone's if you assume a similar cost, you can tell what someone's margin or estimated margin is, right? Um, which I think is is a very interesting kind of bit thing to be able to kind of backwards work out from uh, from the market. So we've covered product selection. If we go back to particular pricing decisions, um, mm-hmm. one of our studies has shown that less than fifty percent of pricing decisions are competitor driven. Okay, as in, so if you haven't got access to sales history and you haven't got access to uh, the w- the weather weather influencing and all of this other other gump right the cycles yeah and you're just looking at competitor data from what you've seen what's the one of the ways that that retailers and shopify retailers in particular can identify which products are maybe competitor driven that i have to maintain parity with and which that i potentially have got an opportunity to separate my decision from from market movements. Well, i'd say first and foremost if even if you're not plugging your sales history into a tool like black Cub, you should be looking at it uh, and uh, and most people will be looking at week and week sales i mean uh, so i think that, that i I'll, I'll take your kind of hypothetical and then i'll answer it with the, with the sales history but so you can just like you can identify price movement in the market right so the more competitive products tend to have more price movements the more uh, price driven ones tend to have more price movements as people steal a march from it um and that might be weekly rather than monthly price changes it might be daily rather than weekly price changes but if you sort by the number of price changes and look at the products at the top you'll tend to find okay these are the ones that like i don't know either branded or easily accessible FMCGs or, or, or whatever, where there's supply chains easy. The only real, the something like Dyson's a good example where people are buying Dyson more because of the Dyson brand than your brand, like the, the brand and the product is just strong or Nike, Nike uh, would be another one. People trust it because it's Nike. As long as you look like you're not selling fakes, you're all right, right? And then, so these tend to be quite price driven across suppliers. Uh, or second or resellers, um, and see, and you'll see that just by counting the number of price changes, uh, a product, and then you can say, okay, well, these ones I do need to follow competitors on, or have some, or have a competitor-based strategy, I should say, so stick close to the line, and the rest I can go and look for opportunities. Some of them, this is where the sales becomes important, though, because you don't want to waste time on products that aren't selling, right? So, products aren't selling because of lack of demand. One of the factors in demand is price. You can test with the price, uh, especially if you've got competitive data, just have a look. It's like, am I more expensive than, than my competitors? If I am, that's probably an issue. I'll try matching them at the bottom. Look at the sales. If it hasn't changed, put the price back and then say, okay, the demand for these is, is it seasonal? Is it lack of advertising? Is it whatever? But it's not price driven. So there's no point losing margin there to come down and match because if you're selling low volume anyway it's not the price that's driving that right um so so this is why the sales history even if you're not doing it automatically through tooling you you need to be using it to focus on where you're actually going to get the most value out of your time in, in terms of triaging the products to look at right and also one of the things that um that that tooling helps you to do is focus on on the relevant relevant products right so you win you know some of the low hanging fruit you win absolutely no prizes by being the cheapest if you are lower than everybody else so if yeah, the worst yeah, yeah. like if anything raise your price to being the 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 lowest match competitor Okay, right. Unless you're doing a particular loss leader strategy 
to and and you've made it a strategic objective right invariably 99 out of 100 even 999 <laughs> times out of a thousand right yeah you can tell me that i won't believe you if it's in your long tail you haven't looked at it for six months <laughs> the market's moved it'll be too expensive or too cheap exactly exactly <laughs> so so i think one of the things it can do is especially in the early days of of using a product which gives you visibility of competitor data is look at well, look at the extremities like mm. where are you massively cheaper and where are you massively more expensive right so what rob was alluding to earlier was about how you can identify the products that change price more often are the ones that are more than likely not always but more than likely to be you know market driven products so you have to maintain parity to the market but you'll probably actually find that you're already probably in the in the boundaries of where they should be. There might be one or two that have dropped out, but really it's it's the ones that you haven't looked at as often at either end, cheapest and more expensive. Go and have a look at those. Go and work out, you know, do do some price tests of is this is this because I'm off the market, you know, as, as a starting point. That that's a that's a good good place. I mean, they're more than likely, as we've said. That, that price isn't the only factor in, in driving people's decisions, but we're trying to work out here, you're trying to go through an exercise towards pricing maturity of how much can price influence the growth of my business and where it does influence and where it doesn't influence. And this, um, it's worth mentioning that this has, we find this has like knock on beyond volume, right? Or just selling revenue and profitability. You can feed this information back into the rest of your business. So when we say don't waste time on it, if you can analyze it and work out its low demand, no matter what you do, or you just can't compete because other people have a lower cost base, don't focus on it, right? If you have to hold it, hold it, but but focus your the rest of your business strategy around other products, um, whether that's adver advertisement, people's time, resourcing, product selection, brand strategy, whatever. Um, if you can't compete, unless you have a really, really strong brand, you're going to struggle. So it, that this is where I think basically what Maurice was doing is the saying, okay, I can compete on these and I can't compete on these. So I'm going to focus on these products and I'm going to build my business and brand around these products and not these. I can hold these say, cause I'm drop shipping them. It doesn't cost me anything apart from a bit of like design on my website and maybe a bit Pottery, but that's cool. And if they sell this one, they don't, they don't, but I can't do anything about them anyway. So why worry? Like, um, and that's, the, that's the reality of it. And, and I don't want to give too much of the game away of what we're recording next, but you know, <laughs> this, it has the knock on effects of saving you expenditure, for example, on Google shopping, right. On, mm. on paid advertising that, you know, if you're going to struggle to, if you're, if you're going to struggle, you've used the data to identify that whatever I do, I'm not going to sell this product. You know, you, you don't need to, to spend money on Google advertising on that product. Go and focus on where you can, you can shift stock. But I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to park us there because, 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 because we'll give the game away. So that's a teaser that, uh, to, to, to come back next, uh, next episode. Um, the other bit that I'd like to touch upon is time of day and day of the week. You know, how can learning these these kind of metrics help help a retailer on Shopify? What, what can they do with it? Um, again, it comes back to learning about your marketplace and frequency of your marketplace and competition. Um, so you can see, there's, two, there's, this, there's a tactical stuff where you can steal a march, right? So if, if you're in a price-driven product and you see someone makes their price changes on a, on a Monday, you can just automatically make them on a Tuesday. So you know what's happening. You say it's usually actually people do like Friday nights kind of thing, get it done, get the new prices in for the weekend and then come back on Monday morning and have another look, see what's going on. Did it work? Did it not work? Um, things are quite, humans are quite kind of predictable often. Um, so you can see a march in that regard, which is quite nice. You can understand people's internal business processes. You can understand... I mean, honestly, if if you you can probably understand when they're having the, the the business meetings around pricing and when when that gets pushed live and all the, all the rest of it, um, and I think the 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 interesting thing for me is understanding also which competitors you have to worry about in terms of pricing and which you don't. Um, we see a lot of the time that you'll have. 
more agile businesses for one of a better term that are changing prices fairly regularly because as we've spoken before it kind of it you have to have quite efficient business processes or operational excellence to do it do it well and 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 do it and then you'll get other people who don't um change prices all that often and then you know that, that actually if you're making a price driven decision against one of those people that doesn't make it that often that's going to stick for a while so your ev your like expected value on that decision is probably quite high because say they're not going to catch up for two three weeks a month happy days you've got a month of trading where you're taking all the volume away from them and unless they kind of are on that product um they're not going to respond to that so that's where i think the frequency becomes more most useful really it's just understanding again the makeup of the specific competitors and what fights to pick against people because also if you're if you're looking at it and uh, we've we've seen this where people are using a competitor's product so uh, and we see we see these interesting patterns where the prices we brand each other you, you there's no point picking a price fight based solely on competitor pricing with those guys because you're just in this kind of equilibrium where you make a change they make a change you make a change they make a change. Uh, and like you're both responding at the same seed so you're happy at keeping up and you leave it but then you don't worry about price of that product and you look at other ways of driving demand and when we're, when you're in that space of you follow you making a move them following you make a move them following this is what we refer back to what um maurice was was mentioning around it can lead to a potential race to the bottom and this is why it's so important to use competitive data not just simply on its face value to use it to to learn the market forces the market trends work out where you need to maintain parity work out which competitors are relevant which competitors are not relevant who you know one of the things that um that we're experimenting with the moment and we're we're really excited to hopefully launch the world soon is is you know who's got pricing power who hasn't got pricing power because you might find that actually in the world in the previous existence you've been following competitors that that you're not you actually you don't need to worry about they're not the ones driving driving the market actually you need to worry about this particular this particular retailer um, i mean why on earth is 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 john lewis why on earth is ano.com why are after these big names not the cheapest because they don't have to be, because mm -hmm. they've invested, as Maurice has said at the, the earlier, they've worked out what their pricing power is and, and, and are using that to, to support them. So um, so you've touched upon earlier in terms of retailers, how yeah. retailers of Shopify, who are using Shopify platform, can get access to pricing technology. Uh, it's, a, it's a case of uh, clicking a button on our website uh, and then and then getting them set up um, following mm -hmm. an initial, initial conversation. And within you know less than 24 hours, we can be having a material conversation around well these are the market trends these are where you've got these are where where you've got opportunities to increase price and decrease price um would you be able to sort of uh, fill the listeners a bit more in uh, in how our tracker product in particular um can help that primarily covers many yeah, sure. of the points we've been speaking about hasn't that doesn't it yeah so, so tracker for for us is is really just looking at the market it's, it's there's no so we we have a suite um so we have tracker which is uh aggregating data and giving you the power to to analyze it within the system and our dashboards we've then got challenger uh which adds in a competitive repricer which will feed back directly into your store if you're on shopify and then the finally we've got commander which adds more bells and whistles but uh, really as a sales driven stuff um to protect kind of it adds the demand driven side to competitive repricing, which we've talked about before. So tracker and actually tracker is the easiest to set up and get going with because there's actually no business risk to you at all outside of the 70 quid or however much it, it, it is, uh, depending on how many, how it's priced based on your business. But like realistically, all you do is you give us your identifiers, GTINs or whatever we go off within 24 hours, as Philip says, we've got the data back and you can interrogate it in the dashboard. Um, there's often a bit of cleaning up and settings around, okay, these are, I want to exclude these eBay sellers or, or these Amazon sellers because it, it's, it's a different marketplace. I don't class them as true competitors or whatever, but really it's that simple. We click on the app, uh, we'll get the app set for, for Shopify, you get the app set up for a private app. Um, that doesn't know of two handshake, which just means we can put in the, the columns we need. Um, and that will that will automatically often do it. The great thing about the app version as well is if you decide you want to make pricing decisions based off the back of that, you're already hooked up. 
Um, so you can very easily step up the product levels if you perceive the value in them. Um, so the automated pricing piece that you get in Challenger or the demand-driven kind of safeguarding and increase the revenue that you, you get in Commander, it just becomes a, a very simple click of a button for us to then upgrade you um, because you're in that ecosystem fully connected. And that, for me, is the real powerful, the power of Shopify or BigCommerce or, or, or these these uh, these ways of doing e-com because that app ecosystem means the tooling you can get up and running with is really rapid and actually with fairly low uh, risk integration risk from your end. Fantastic. And so uh, as we come to the the top of the hour, is there anything else that you'd like to give to the Shopify <laughs> users of uh, of the world? No, I, I would say that if you're not. Um, if you're not using competitive data, the tracker thing is a really good. The tracker product is a really good place to start because if you're doing what um, Marie says, it will help you do that very easily. You just go through product by product, look at the competitor landscape, who's selling, who's not selling. Um, I'd also suggest if you are drop shipping um, or ha- where or running in a market where cost base is uh, highly volatile. Um, but looking at, say, something like our Challenger, an automatic repricing tool, is probably worth the few hundred quid a month just to save you the time of passing the the cost prices on and keeping all your products at competitive in the marketplace. So I'd be looking primarily at those two initially. And then if you're obviously, if you're more sophisticated, please have a conversation with us about, about our Commander edition. Um, but, but if you haven't done anything before, I would say test it out with... Tracker, check the data is correct, eyeball it, use it in your product selection, and then think very hard about automating that process because, actually, to quote Shopify, uh, focus on brand, automate everything else. Like, that, that's what you need to do. It's, it's wasted effort if it's something you can automate. So you can dip your toes in the water with Tracker, learn a lot, uh, mm-hmm. and as your appetite grows, your confidence grows, and as you as you opened up your eyes to to the power of pricing automation, uh, you can you can grow grow with it. So so thank you very much, Rob, for for joining me today, and uh, thank you for your prop. I'm going to have to up my game for, <laughs> yeah, for yeah, you the are. next the next recording session. So uh, I'm quaking my boots. I'll make sure I, I have to I have to get on Etsy or something, won't I? And record and and buy something uh, bespoke because <laughs> that, if that's the way that we're going, you're going to put. Are we going to get budget? Can we get budget? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't didn't go that far. I didn't go that. Far. Oh, whoa, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Come on, come on, come on. I'm um, sure Nelson will sign it. <laughs> have to get him on a good day. So, yeah, uh, yeah. so we've been looking at how to tackle competitive pricing and your pricing decisions on the Shopify platform in particular. Uh, there's uh, many ways to go about it, but really I we, we look at it in kind of a three-stage process. Stage one, you can use our kind of tracker product as well to support you with this, get a feel for the market, identify what products are market-driven, what products are not market-driven, and all of the associated benefits of what products are supporting you with product selection. And as you as you grow from that, you can then start to enact your pricing decisions with with our challenger product um, and then you can move into the bells and the whistles with our commander commander product but actually you'd be surprised with the power of simply having visibility and making um, making a few automated changes changes off the back of that so if you'd like to try out uh, our product and you're a shopify user simply head to blackcurve.com and click the button in the top right hand corner of our website so we have been black curve we help e-commerce businesses make make pricing decisions this is our podcast e-commerce matters available on all major podcasting platforms look forward to seeing you next time take care bye-bye